Hi guys, uh, today I'm basically going to talk about questions 7 to 12 of uh, AIMCAT 1812. Now, this is basically based on a, a passage which talks about the philosophy of society which changes over a period of time. Now, this particular uh, passage is a bit daunting for certain people, uh, but it is not that difficult once you read it uh, a bit carefully. Now, what we are expected to do is go through this particular passage. And uh, when we go through this passage, we try to take, it, take in exactly what is being said. Uh, it is essentially divided into several paragraphs and each paragraph is talking about each separate point. The first paragraph essentially says that for a philosophy of society to be effective, it must be as mobile and realistic. It needs to be flexible as the forces which it would control. So the forces keep on changing. This one also needs to change. Now, the fact is that the the medieval society could not really change or adapt to time and uh, one of the problems which it uh, faced was the problem which it specifically mentions is that of usury or the money lender he was a figure who was wanted at the same time and hated at the same time so this is essentially what it is uh, this passage in brief talks about changes in the society, the inability of the medieval society to actually change with the times as a result of which one of its uh, one of its very uh, characteristic uh, features uh, of the of the peasant, the landlord, as well as the external moneylender to whom uh, everybody went, uh, this kind of a situation created tension even as the moneylender was a compulsory feature he had to be he had to be there because everybody needed him now this is essentially what the the passage talks about now how do we do the reading of this particular passage you read the passage through certain stages the first time when you read the passage you read the passage only for a general understanding you do not rush through the passage but you do read the passage a little quickly you do not read each and every word uh, for its meaning you do not read for detail you read for essentially understanding what he is saying so this is known as skimming you essentially skim the passage to get a gist of the passage what is the passage saying and even if you do not understand one particular word uh, so it's all right even if you do not want to understand one particular word you can go right ahead and get an overall understanding so we have uh, gone through this we will uh, uh, essentially go through this passage and find out what is being said you can always go back to your own um, uh, AIMCAT, AIMCAT uh, 1812 and uh, then you can read the passage yourself because I am going to go directly to question number seven. Now question number seven talks about according to the passage the reforms in medieval ethical doctrine were required because now before I see the options why was uh, reform required in medieval ethical doctrines it's written at the very very first line that if a philosophy of society is to be effective it must be as mobile and realistic as the forces which it would control. So that is the main reason. Medieval uh, economic, uh, so it's talking about your, uh, you know, the medieval ethical doctrine was required. Reform was required because that was not the case in the medieval economic society and ethical society. It had to change. So let's go back and see which paraphrase comes closest. The sweeping changes could not do away with the focus that affected the ethical conduct. Nowhere in the passage it talks about the focus. So that is out. There was a great progress in the field of commerce and conventional tribute needed to be paid to the wisdom of the past. An absolute, uh, you know, this is a definitely not the correct answer. So this is an obvious wrong answer. We go through this and then we come to the new changes that helped in solving the problem of the conduct. No. Uh, it had not really solved anything. As a matter of fact, uh, new uh, developments in the social uh, hierarchy, in the social structure has actually created the problems, has actually made the problems even more severe. So we, we should be able to find uh, a particular line which talks about it. Mm, just give me one second. I should be able to find... Uh, one line which should be able to tell you that and the line is uh, this was essentially something which was accentuated right 
So it was essentially something, the problem was something which was actually accentuated by changes which were happening. So A cannot happen, uh, B cannot happen obviously and D, the vast changes in the scenario aggravated the problem seems to be the only one which is correct because C is also wrong. So let's check our answers. That should be the correct answer. Now we move on to question number 8 because we have already read the passage. We know what is being talked about. Let's go to 8 right now. When we go to 8, 8 says that the special economic malaise of an age is naturally the obverse of its special qualities. So we go down to that particular passage and see what is the author referring to. The special economic malaise of an age. The special economic malaise of an age is the obverse or the opposite of its special qualities. What is the special quality? The special quality is that we have it is not the exploitation of the wage earning proletariat from its employers, but from the relation of the producer to his landlord. And at the same time, there is also the capitalist. So this is it. Three people, the capitalist, the producer, the landlord. And it's not really the, the employed and the employer. So we have the serious economic problems of an age are the reverse of its noteworthy traits. But what is he specifically referring to? A is out. Independence in vocation and dependence on external assistance go hand in hand. Mm. This seems to be seems to be somewhat similar to our paraphrase. Independence in vocation because it is no longer an employed a person who is essentially doing somebody's bidding. Here it is a person who is a producer and his relationship with the landlord on one hand and on the other hand uh, there is the money lender. So the third one, remarkable economic feature of the society generally has an opposing trend. Again, a very general statement because the question is a very specific question referring to a particular line. Therefore, the answer needs to be a textual answer. And the distinctive aspect of a community is offset by its virtuosity. So as you can see, a specific question requiring a specific textual answer. Three options are very general. Therefore, B must be my answer. And so it is. So now we move on to question number nine. Now, when we go to question number nine, let's see what does nine say. Nine talks about, we understand from the passage that absence of rigidity and impracticality, absence of rigidity and impracticality in an ideology would enable it to absorb present trends in order to shape the future. Okay, so these are the four things. So absence of rigidity and absence of impracticality in an ideology. So let's find that part where it does talk about it. Mm. Absence of rigidity and absence of impracticality. It's somewhere in the top part that it talks about. You see, I remember where they have by and large talked about because uh, uh, I have read the passage and I do retain a little bit about it. So, mm, let's find out. Right. So, we go back to the first line. That is, the absence of rigidity. So, it has to be uh, mobile, flexible. Absence of rigidity means flexible. And uh, it has to be... Uh, absence of impracticality, which essentially means that it has to be realistic. So we come, if a philosophy or a society is to be effective, that's a word, it has to be effective. It must be as mobile and realistic as the forces which it would control. So it has to be effective in order to control or shape. So now let's take a look at it. Would enable it to absorb present trends. Well, uh, the line does not talk about absorbing present trends in order to shape the future. Mm, it's not so much shape the future as about controlling the future. It's about controlling and 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 uh, is it the future? So it says if philosophy is to be effective, it does, uh, does not say anything about it. It says that for a society, philosophy of society to be effective, it must be flexible and realistic as the forces that it would control. It says nothing about the tense. Let's move on. Would enable it to provide solutions for day-to-day -day problems no, it's not mentioned in that line, would render it efficacious in the role of regulation. Efficacious, effective in the role of regulation, control. Yes, this seems to be pretty close. 
to my paraphrase would render it sound enough to help society face challenges not mentioned so my paraphrase was that in order to if 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 a particular uh, philosophy of the society is to be effective then it must be uh, it must it must have basically a lack of uh, impracticality which means it must be realistic solidly rooted to the ground and it must also be something which is uh, effective or they should be uh, and it should be flexible so, so flexible means lack of rigidity so this seems to be the answer so c should be the ideal answer and so it is so we now move on to question number 10 what does 10 talk about Hmm. According to the passage, Tudor England was called distributive state because. Now, why is Tudor England, in spite of the property, Tudor England was still a distributive state. Why? It was a community in which ownership of land and the simple tools used in most industries was not the badge of a class, but the attribute of a society in which the typical worker was a peasant farmer, etc., etc., etc. Hmm. Right. So basically the capitalists were the proprietors and the industries and they played a role of rich landlords in medieval England. No, obviously not. Most working people owned material resources. Yes, they owned land, they owned tools because land and tools were not the were not uh, something which which was uh, restricted to a particular class, but it was something which was communities. That seems to be OK. An average worker was a peasant. Uh, a tradesman, craftsman, a land was freely distributed. Yes, that was characteristic of the society, but that was not the reason why it would be called a distributive state. Remember one thing, there would be choices which would be obviously incorrect. There would be choices which are fairly close. And you have asked me how to, uh, many times you have asked me how do we distinguish between the, between the two. There would also be answers which are correct in the sense that they are mentioned in the passage. However, what is important for you to note is look at the question. Does the answer which uh, is mentioned in the passage, does that answer the question? Here, for instance, an average worker was a peasant, tradesman, craftsman, land distributed to them. That's true. But that is not the reason why it is called a distributive state. The beggars in England, obviously, that is wrong. So the answer, ideally speaking, should be B. Because, as it says, if you take a look at it, that uh, it was a community in which ownership of land and of the simple tools, so these are material resources, used in most industries was not the badge of a class, of a class, but the attribute of a society. In this society, of course, typical workers were peasant farmers, tradesmen, etc., etc. So my answer should be B. B should be my answer. And so it is. Now we move on to question 11 and then one more and then hopefully you should be able to attempt them yourself. Now we come back and see the Middle Ages, the common man could not explain why usury was wrong. Okay, so if the common man was asked why usury was wrong, he would have quoted from the scripture. If he was asked for a definition of usury, he would have repeated the words of a member of parliament who spoke that it standeth doubtful what usury is. We have no true definition of it. Now, in the Middle Ages, the common man could not explain why usury was wrong because the word usury had different connotation as it was a stretchable term. The scriptures did not guide him adequately and hence he remained confused. St. Thomas gave varied interpretations of usury in his doctrines and St. Raymond's manual provided different definitions of usury. A member of parliament claimed that there was no true definition of usury. Now, if a common man was asked why usury was wrong, he would have. So, the common man could not explain why usury was wrong. He could not explain why it was wrong. If he was asked why he was wrong, he would have quoted from the scripture. If he was asked for a definition of usury, he would have repeated in the words of the parliament, it standard in doubt what usury is. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's see the answer. Um, 
Thomas gave, said Thomas gave varied interpretation should not be the answer. A member of parliament said that there was no true definition of uh, usury, right? And why was usury wrong? He could not explain why usury wrong, most probably because the scriptures which he quoted, uh, you know, if the common man was asked why usury was wrong, he would have simply quoted from the scripture, right? Scriptures did not guide him adequately and hence he remained confused. And a member of the parliament claimed that there was no true definition of usury. Please understand, St. Thomas gave varied interpretation in his doctrines and St. Raymond's public manual provided different definitions of usury. They don't seem to match. The word usury had different connotations as it was a stretchable term. In reality, alike in Middle Ages, the word usury had not a such specialized sound. Okay. So, as it's given, the interpretation placed on the word by those who expounded ecclesiastical theories of usury was equally elastic. Okay. It was elastic. So, the word usury, elastic, stretchable term. So, that's it. The word usury had different connotation as it was a stretchable term. The scriptures did not guide him adequately and hence he remained confused. We are told that he quoted the scriptures. The scriptures did not guide him adequately is an assumption. So that's why I should not go for it. St. Thomas, St. Raymond not mentioned. St. Thomas might be mentioned even though it might be in a different context. St. Raymond is not mentioned. Hence, we are not concerned about that part. Member of the parliament has claimed that there is no true definition of usury. The question is why usury was wrong. So that is not the correct answer. By default, the answer should be A. But if you want to know the reason, it is given out there. That it did not have specialized sense. It was a stretchable term and interpretation placed on the word by those who expounded ecclesiastical theories of usury was equally elastic and therefore it was a stretchable term. Right, so now we move on to the last question, question number 12, and that should bring us to a close of this particular passage. So, which of the following best conclude and complete the last sentence of the penultimate paragraph of the passage? So, you're talking about it, the essence of the medieval scheme of economic ethics. Now, one of the things is that we should always look at the top two lines of a passage that should give you an idea of what the topic is all about. And this is almost like a last sentence, the paragraph completion. So this particular sentence should not be something which opens up another topic, which requires a new explanation. So let's look at that. It is not surprising that there should have been a popular outcry against extortion. The doctrine as to the ethics of economic conduct which had been formulated in the medieval popes was rehearsed by the English divines in the 16th century, not merely as conventional tribute paid to a formal piety to the wisdom of the past, but because the swift changes of the period in commercial and agricultural had not softened but accentuated the problems of conduct for which it had been designed. Okay. So the problems had been accentuated. Fine. And then it goes on. So the insistence had been on equity in bargaining. A contract in f is fair when both parties gain from it equally. The prohibition of usury had been the kernel of its doctrines, not because the gains of the moneylender were the only specie. Okay. but because in the economic condition of the age, they were most conspicuous species of extortion. But because extortion had a way of life for many is not mentioned, so I'm not going to talk about it. Because the gains of the money lender destroyed his own moral title, he had every man's living and no man's duty, again, doesn't close the paragraph. This is talking about something else. Uh, but because they were one subordinate element in a comprehensive system of social philosophy which gave its own poignant poignancy to the controversy of which it became the center. Um, again, this is something which is not mentioned in the paragraph itself. By default, it should be 
B because B says um, because look at the sentence the prohibition of usury had been the kernel of its doctrines why was why was prohibition the center point of its doctrine not because the gains of moneylender were the only specie okay but because in the economic conditions of the age they were the most conspicuous of specie of extortion and we have already talked about extortion in the beginning there was an outcry against extortion so this seems to be the only one which is actually bringing about a close of that paragraph the rest of them if i look at it uh, subordinate element is not being talked about gains of money lender destroyed his own moral title not talked about extortion has become a way of life for many it does talk about extortion but way of life for many is something again which is not mentioned in the paragraph should be b right so this brings me to an end of these uh, six question rc of the philosophy passage and if you go through this carefully this should give you some idea of how do we read the passage uh, actually know the essence of the passage know the passage very well spend a little time on understanding the passage and then take each question at a time and try to solve it and as you solve it remember never ever assume it has to be mentioned in the passage somewhere go back if the answer is a very specific line go back check out that line read it paraphrase and then match your response match all those options with your paraphrase so this is question numbers 7 to 12 of aimcat 1812 it's fair when both parties gain from it equally the prohibition of usury had been the kernel of its doctrines not because the gains of the money lender were the only specie okay but because in the economic condition of the age they were most conspicuous species of extortion but because extortion at a way of life for many is not mentioned so i'm not going to talk about it because the gains of the money lender destroyed his own moral title he had every man's living and no man's duty again doesn't close the paragraph this is talking about something else uh, but because they were one subordinate element in a comprehensive system of social philosophy which gave its own poignant poignancy to the controversy of which it became the center um, again this is something which is not mentioned in the paragraph itself by default it should be b because b says um, because look at the sentence the prohibition of usury had been the kernel of its doctrines why was why was prohibition the center point of its doctrine not because the gains of money lender were the only specie okay but because in the economic conditions of the age they were the most conspicuous of specie of extortion and we have already talked about extortion in the beginning there was an outcry against extortion so this seems to be the only one which is actually bringing about a close of that paragraph the rest of them if i look at it uh, subordinate element is not being talked about gains of money lender destroyed his own moral title not talked about extortion has become a way of life for many it does talk about extortion but way of life for many is something again which is not mentioned in the paragraph should be b right so this brings me to an end of these uh, six question rc of the philosophy passage and if you go through this carefully this should give you some idea of how do we read the passage uh, actually know the essence of the passage know the passage very well spend a little time on understanding the passage and then take each question at a time and try to solve it and as you solve it remember never ever assume it has to be mentioned in the passage somewhere go back if the answer is a very specific line go back check out that line read it paraphrase and then match your response match all those options with your paraphrase so this is Question numbers 7 to 12 of AIMCAT 1812.
in reality alike in middle ages the word usury had not a such special sense okay so as it's given the interpretation placed on the word by those who expounded ecclesiastical theories of usury was equally elastic okay it was elastic so the word usury elastic stretchable term so that's it the word usury had different connotation as it was a stretchable term the scriptures did not guide him adequately and hence he remained confused we are told that he quoted the scriptures the scriptures did not guide him adequately is an assumption so that's why i should not go for it saint thomas saint raymond not mentioned saint thomas might be mentioned even though it might be in a different context saint raymond is not mentioned hence we are not concerned about that part member of the parliament has claimed that there is no true definition of usury the question is why usury was wrong so that is not the correct answer by default the answer should be a but if you want to know the reason it is given out there that it did not a specialized sense it was a stretchable term and interpretation placed on the word by those who expounded ecclesiastical theories of usury was equally elastic and therefore it was a stretchable term right so now we move on to the last question question number 12 and that should bring us to a close of this particular passage so which of the following best conclude and complete the last sentence of the penultimate paragraph of the passage so you're talking about it the essence of the medieval scheme of economic ethics now one of the things is that we should always look at the top two lines of a passage that should give you an idea of what the topic is all about and this is almost like a last sentence the paragraph completion so this particular sentence should not be something which opens up another topic which requires a new explanation so let's look at that it is not surprising that there should have been a popular outcry against extortion the doctrine as to the ethics of economic conduct which had been formulated in medieval popes was rehearsed by the english divines in 16th century not merely as conventional tribute paid to a formal piety to the wisdom of the past but because the swift changes of the period in commercial and agricultural had not softened but accentuated the problems of conduct for which it had been designed okay so the problems had been accentuated fine and then it goes on so the insistence had been on equity in bargaining a contract and this was essentially something which was accentuated right so it was essentially something the problem was something which was actually accentuated by changes which were happening so a cannot happen uh, b cannot happen obviously and d the vast changes in the scenario aggravated the problem seems to be the only one which is correct because c is also wrong so let's check our answers that should be the correct answer now we move on to question number 8 because we have already read the passage we know what is being talked about let's go to 8 right now when we go to 8 it says that the special economic malaise of an age is naturally the obverse of its special qualities so we go down to that particular passage and see what is the author referring to the special economic malaise of an age the special economic malaise of an age is the obverse or the opposite of its special qualities what is the special quality the special quality is that we have it is not the exploitation of the wage earning proletariat from its employers but from the relation of the producer to his landlord and at the same time there is also the capitalist so this is it three people the capitalist the producer the landlord and it's not really the the employed and the employer so we have the serious economic problems of an age are the reverse of its noteworthy traits but what is he specifically referring to a is out independence in vocation and dependence on external assistance go hand in hand mm this seems to be seems to be somewhat similar to our paraphrase independence in vocation because it is no longer an employed a person who is essentially doing somebody's bidding here it is a person who is a producer and his relationship with the landlord on one hand and on the other hand uh, there is the money lender 
So the third one, remarkable economic feature of the society generally has an opposing trend. Again, a very general statement because the question is a very specific question referring to a particular line. Therefore, the answer needs to be a textual answer. And the distinctive aspect of a community is offset by its virtuosity. So as you can see, a specific question requiring a specific textual answer, three options are very general. Therefore, B must be my answer. And so it is. So now we move on to question number nine. Now, when we go to question number nine, let's see what does nine say. Nine talks about, we understand from the passage that absence of rigidity and impracticality, absence of rigidity and impracticality in an ideology would enable it to absorb present trends in order to shape the future. Okay, so these are the four things. So absence of rigidity and absence of is why usury was wrong. So that is not the correct answer. By default, the answer should be A. But if you want to know the reason, it is given out there. That it did not have a specialized sense. It was a stretchable term and interpretation placed on the word by those who expounded ecclesiastical theories of usury was equally elastic. And therefore, it was a stretchable term. Right. So now we move on to the last question. Question number 12. And that should bring us to a close of this particular passage. So, which of the following best conclude and complete the last sentence of the penultimate paragraph of the passage? So, you're talking about it. The essence of the medieval scheme of economic ethics. Now, one of the things is that we should always look at the top two lines of a passage. That should give you an idea of what the topic is all about. And this is almost like a last sentence, the paragraph completion. So this particular sentence should not be something which opens up another topic, which requires a new explanation. So let's look at that. It is not surprising that there should have been a popular outcry against extortion. The doctrine as to the ethics of economic conduct, which had been formulated in medieval popes, was rehearsed by the English divines in the 16th century, not merely as conventional tribute paid to a formal piety to the wisdom of the past, but because the swift changes of the period in commercial and agricultural had not softened, but accentuated the problems of conduct for which it had been designed. Okay. So the problems had been accentuated. Fine. And then it goes on. So the insistence had been on equity in bargaining. A contract in f is fair when both parties gain from it equally. The prohibition of usury had been the kernel of its doctrines, not because the gains of the money lender were the only specie. Okay. But because in the economic condition of the age, they were most conspicuous specie of extortion. But because extortion at a way of life for many is not mentioned, so I'm not going to talk about it. Because the gains of the money lender destroyed his own moral title. He had every man's living and no man's duty. Again, doesn't close the paragraph. This is talking about something else. Uh, but because they were one subordinate element in a comprehensive system of social philosophy, which gave its own poignant poignancy to the controversy of which it became the center. Um, Again, this is something which is not mentioned in the paragraph itself. By default, why usury was wrong? He could not explain why it was wrong. If he was asked why he was wrong, he would have quoted from the scripture. If he was asked for a definition of usury, he would have repeated in the words of the parliament, it's standard in doubt what usury is. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's see the answer. Um, Thomas gave, St. Thomas gave varied interpretation should not be the answer. A member of parliament said that there was no true definition of uh, usury. Right. And why was usury wrong? 
He could not explain why usury is wrong, most probably because the scriptures which he quoted, uh, you know, if the common man was asked why usury was wrong, he would have simply quoted from the scripture, right? Scriptures did not guide him adequately and hence he remained confused. And a member of the parliament claimed that there was no true definition of usury. Please understand, St. Thomas gave varied interpretation in his doctrines and St. Raymond's public manual provided different definitions of usury. They don't seem to match. The word usury had different connotations as it was a stretchable term. In reality, alike in Middle Ages, the word usury had not a such specialized other. Okay. So, as it's given, the interpretation placed on the word by those who expounded ecclesiastical theories of usury was equally elastic. Okay, it was elastic. So, the word usury, elastic, stretchable term. So, that's it. The word usury had different connotation as it was a stretchable term. The scriptures did not guide him adequately and hence he remained confused. We are told that he quoted the scriptures. The scriptures did not guide him adequately is an assumption. So that's why I should not go for it. St. Thomas, St. Raymond not mentioned. St. Thomas might be mentioned even though it might be in a different context. St. Raymond is not mentioned. Hence, we are not concerned about that part. Member of the parliament has claimed that there is no true definition of usury. The question is why usury was wrong. So that is not the correct answer. By default, the answer should be A. But if you want to know the reason, it is given out there. That it did not have a specialized sense. It was a stretchable term and interpretation placed on the word by those who expounded ecclesiastical theories of usury was equally elastic and therefore it was a stretchable term. Right. So now we move on to the 